Welcome to Sneaker University, the one place where you can learn the entire process of sneaker design from scratch. Ten steps from thumbnail sketching, engineering, CAD development and rendering for presentation, outsole design and drafting, and spec and pattern construction drawing preparation for pullovers and prototype perfecting, and production sample confirmation, including every other step and stage in between. Learn from a pro. I'm Cyrus L. I perfected this process over the span of my career in the footwear industry with over 10 million pairs of kicks sold, hundreds of designs created and produced. I came into the industry as one of the top artists in the country and I learned to parlay my artistic ability into pure industrial design and engineering and quickly earned a name as a great designer working with endorsed athletes as the director of basketball and cross training at one of the major brands. And now, well established with my own brands, you can learn this lost process from the best in the industry. Let's go. Classes in session. Welcome back to Sneaker University. Uh, this is episode number two. We'll be working on engineering. I'm gonna show you uh, this stage in the process where you take your finished thumbnail sketch and you work through the stages of bringing it to an actual size, uh, realistic drawing. Um, and, and when you do that, you have to work out all of the mechanics, including the upper pattern, the way that it comes together, your lacing system, the way your tongue um, and collar uh, are assembled. You'll get about 90% of your outsole will come together in this stage from the side. You'll see, be able to see an outsole from the sidewall point of view. Um, and you can work out the rest of the de details later when we get into the drafting of the outsole and the design. Um, and it all comes together. You, there's no coloring done during this stage. Your color blocking is already established during the thumbnail sketch. And if you do this correctly, um, you'll be ready to implement your uh, drawing into the computer via a CAD drawing. Uh, and then you work your colorways. I'm gonna use three different existing patterns, uh, prototypes, projects that, uh, that I've built in the past to, to basically illustrate this uh, stage, including uh, a running program called the Mach 5, which we were looking at last week, as well as a basketball program called the Triumph, is the 20th, 20th anniversary program for Grand Hill through Fila, and also the Triple Double, which is also a basketball uh, program I did for the Harlem Globetrotters. But first, I want to recap um, last episode, we, were, we went over thumbnails, and I want to do a recap on thumbnails. Uh, last uh, episode, we used the APU simulator, and I showed you how to lay out thumbnails on your page and basically utilize um, the, the way that you sketch and how to best maximize your time so you're efficient and you can work quickly and what to look for to zero in and reach uh, a strong thumbnail finish, which is essentially the soul of any design. Um, and um, I wanna take a look at some thumbnails that I did for Fila um, back in 2015 to show you how that works and really um, you know, restate um, that also, you know, you use your light box and your overlays once you have an idea, but while you're searching for an idea, you work across your page from left to right, and you don't stop until you get something that's actually pretty cool, and then you begin to build on it with overlays. Uh, but you can also continue to just jump around and create new ideas as well, um, you know, and um, so let's, let's do that first. These are some sketches um, that were produced for Fila uh, back in 2006, these thumbnail sketches. This actually is also a pretty good example of uh, cleaner thumbnail sketches that uh, show you know, how the development process happens. You can see me thinking on the page here. Some of these are really cool, actually. Uh, some of them evolved into actual shoes and some of them are just steps in the, in the process from real simple large block to intricate detailed actual, actually close to the existing pattern. 
um, that was prototyped. You know, you can see the kind of some of the thought about, uh, there's a little bit of engineering even going on on these about how the uh, lacing will come together on this particular, this was an anniversary of the spaghetti I did for John Epstein and Fila uh, in 2015. You know, see how everything's nice and neatly organized. Um, fall 2017, these are concepts for lifestyle. Um, and then you mix and match. The numbers aren't always in sequential order. That's one of the things I didn't get a chance to say when we were um, going over sketching last week. You know, when you're sketching, although you want to try to get those six across the page, this is a legal size sheet of paper versus a letter size. Letter size is a little tighter. Um, you keep going this way with concepts, and when you get a concept that you like, you know, you may mark it that you like, then you begin the overlay process. So you don't do overlays when you're just trying to find a, a rough idea. You know, these are all different roughs. You can see me working along here. I don't think any of these got repeated. This pattern ends up somewhere else. They're repeated across. And then when you get one that you like, and you can expand on it with overlays. This may have been an overlay uh, here, jump back and forth between pages. You know, these, these I can tell they were probably related because of the shape is the same. Um, pretty cool. You know, you wanna get as much information in your thumbnail as you can, it actually helps. Uh, when you get to the ending process. You, these, are, these are what early sketches look like, kind of real, you know, chicken scratches is what they say. And as these kind of tighten up, this is because it's a little bit later on in the process. If that's sketch seven, eight, nine, ten. You see it get tight, tighter as you go along, um, overlaid. You know, um, these are some more rough type of sketches. So anyway, we're gonna get into uh, some final line drawings. This is what your uh, thumbnail underlay paper looks like at the end of the day after probably about 20 30 different uses you know if I can put that up to the light flip it over me put the light box on you can see there's a lot of different stuff going on in there thumbnail sketches last episode we went over the terminology all of the different terms for the parts on the shoe uh, this episode, I want to introduce you to the production methods that are used in footwear mass production because um, designer sneakers is technically in, uh, falls under the category of industrial design. And in the name industrial design, that hints to what it is. You're building industry. You're mass producing products. That's what sneakers are. You make one uh, product and then you run it through a, what's called, you know, basically run it through a factory and you mass produce that design. So factories actually have production methods, things that they can do and that they can't do. So we're going to go through some of the basics of uh, production methods uh, that in order to be a good sneaker designer, you need to understand. Uh, and I'm going to start with... Um, Compression molding, right? Uh, because the famous, uh, famously, uh, for example, the leader in the industry, uh, Nike actually created its one of his first soles uh, with a waffle iron, you know, and that is a molding process in itself. It's actually a poured mold. We're going to go over poured molds, uh, but I'm going to start with compression molding. Compression molding is a type of a steel mold um, where you take a block of material. Um, in this case, it would be chunks of raw rubber or uh, a, a slab or a, a big chunk of EVA and you put it in between uh, two pieces of steel and they press them into the shape um, that, the, you know, that we actually, you know, input um, in the design. So that's compression molding. Compression molding is used, uh, like I said, for EVA um, and it's used for rubber. So that would be your traditional midsole, traditional outsole. Um, you also have... Uh, it's in the same type of steel molds, you actually have uh, different types of poured molds, right? You know, actually that waffle iron um, is poured, uh, is a poured mold. Technically, all waffles are. You pour the batter into the, the steel mold and you close the lid and then you let it, you know, finish uh, its process, chemical process, in, this, in that case, cooking. In the case of uh, uh, materials like uh, uh, EVA or PU, um, it actually is dries and it chemically sets. Uh, then you open it up and you get your mold. Um, pour molds, I haven't used very many, but I, you know, you can use a pour mold process. I think a pour mold is very basic. You can do that at home. If you end up doing like homemade uh, soles, you pour them on. You could pour it uh, like done in a waffle. It's very simple format. Uh, for the most part, most midsoles and outsoles, like I said, are compression molded. 
Um, but injection molding is another type of a pore mold, technically because the material is a liquid when uh, injected into the to the molds. Um, I was always I didn't do a lot of inject. I've never done a lot of injection molding, um, but I've done some. And I was always taught that an injection mold, um, you know, when you put it into the mold, they're tiny. They're, they are uh, proportionately smaller than they actually are when they're done. And when you pull them out of the molds, they pop um, and expand rapidly. But they hold the shape that they were in when they were, uh, uh, you know, initially uh, molded. Um, so these are some injection molding machines uh, in the footwear, uh, in footwear factories. Um, injection molds, pour molds. You also have, um, a, you know, you need to understand fine molds or TPR molds. These are rubber molds that actually hold a great amount of detail, a lot more detail than you can get uh, with um, Keller lines. We're going to go into Keller lines when we get into the outsoles. Um, on an outsole, a fine mold can take a great amount of detail. Um, and rubber fine molds, all you know, are traditionally used for patches of different types. You can use them in different places on shoes. Um, and um, I think TPR is thermoplastic rubber, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, then you have welding. Welding, you take the di different type of materials. You can take TPR, you can take rubber, you can take uh, poly, you can take PU, polypropylene, and you basically weld it onto the side of a shoe, or, or you can weld to any uh, porous material um, uh, or any material that that uh, whatever is injected will hold to. So most of the time, it's done on mesh because mesh is porous and it allows you the injection mold and say uh, TPR rubber uh, component into it. Um, t uh, TPR, I'm wondering if TPR will stick to PU as we get into, uh, later on, we get into specs, we're going to go into more about the different type of materials. Uh, PU is a type of leather. It's a, a, you know, you have PU leathers and you have like split leather, split leathers where the leather is cut down the middle, uh, and the little raggedy piece in the back, the suede part is actually coated with another layer of skin, pla which is pl basically plastic. And that plastic piece, when melted, will fuse to TPR. It'll fuse to uh, other PUs. So you can weld against uh, the different type of PUs, uh, PU leathers. Um, and then you have straight up synthetic leather as well, which is has no real leather behind it, not even a piece of suede behind it. It's just plastic uh, with microfiber behind it. And again, the skin of it being PU will melt, so it'll fuse uh, properly to the uh, uh, to this whatever is, is welded to it. And, and assuming that it's rubber, plastic, and most materials, most of the time you'll be able to weld pretty nicely against PU. Um, um, or synthetics. Um, you can't weld against leather, not that I'm aware of. Welding on leather doesn't work. There's something about the nature of uh, leather that makes welding very difficult. Um, um, and then you have embossing. A lot of shoes use a process called embossing. Embossing is basically, uh, you know, bring it, it's like a 3D shape of relief for those that understand sculpting. When you do a relief off of a wall, it's a shape that's coming off of a flat surface uh, and is raised out. Uh, embossing, or really there's debossing as well. I didn't list debossing on here, but debossing is the opposite. Instead of being raised, it's cut into uh, the leather. Uh, similar and related to a brand because brands also are fire including fire branding is pressed into so the shape is kind of like carved out of or ingrained looks like it's engraved into uh, your PU your uh, synthetic or uh, your leather uh, leather is very hard to emboss but it's possible uh, embossing is mostly uh, done best in again synthetic because synthetic being plastic is very very malleable you can mold it and shape it um, you can emboss uh, PU leather, uh, which is back with suede, but a lot of times you need a backing of there's different ways that factories use backing sometimes in like raw leather, which is doesn't is very difficult to emboss. You'll use a plastic piece behind it to make it kind of stay popped out. Uh, and if, again, fire branding, I mentioned uh, fire branding is one of my favorite, um, you know, treatments. Uh, you think all you have to do is think about a Levi's patch. Um, which famously has a, a beautiful uh, fire brand on there. A good fire brand is always burned into. Uh, you can fire brand leather, um, but you know you usually don't want to fire brand um, synthetics or PUs. You might be better off uh, debossing because you'll burn through the plastic.
So now you got the uh, terminology and you also have some production methods. There are a few more. We'll, we'll add in as we go along um, parts that I'm one or two parts that I might might have left out of the terminology, like your sock liner, which is the piece that goes into the sole, uh, into the shoe or in the production methods. Um, you know, we'll go over extruding a very cool process is similar to um, you take material, you know, and it, it, it actually extruding is related to like toothpaste is one of the most natural extruding examples that you can give in household products. Uh, and extruding make, is good for making pipes and tubes and uh, different type of uh, cylindrical uh, or, you know, shapes that are actually extruded out. Um, so let's get into the engineering. Now that you understand some of the most some of the basic uh, production methods uh, for making sneakers, um, let's get into the engineering part again. And. That the, the the essence here, the idea here is to take your thumbnail and begin to work out uh, details on how to make it uh, into a complete shoe. One of the coolest parts about engineering is um, figuring out the systems, you know, uh, particularly lacing systems. I'm going to here's a sketch here of, uh, you know, a quick drawing that represents um, the, uh, the the development of the original, I have a shoe called the Gondola, which was one of the Grand Hill 3s. It was, uh, in, um, you know, it was competing to be a Grand Hill 3 in Fufila back in the day, and the la lacing system for the Grand Hill 3 um, was pretty cool, but it, it was engineered uh, through a long process. So trying to figure out, you know, how a lace eyelid can work, and there's various different ways, thinking about all the different materials that you can use. Um, that's part of engineering or engineering an outsole, uh, you know, trying to figure out how you want it to function um, is, is very much so involved in that process because you got to kind of think about how it will be used and what can be done. One of the things about uh, engineering a shoe is that you got to be very careful. You can't just make up anything and then, and then think that the factory will make it. If the factory says, well, do you understand how a steel mold is cut? And, you know, and how it's, you know, how you pull the mold out of the steel mold. You can't have um, parts going in all different directions or else it'll get stuck in the mold. Um, you got to really, you have to understand this when you're building a shoe. Uh, building the technology uh, in the outsole, uh, building the function, building the eyelets. Or even just figuring out the rudimentary stuff like how does the pattern actually work? You know, how does this piece interact with this piece? Um, so let's do some live sketching up and we're going to jump right into that. Um, starting with the Mach 5. So I went over the um, the other thumbnails for this shoe, the uh, Mach uh, 5. These are a few more of the thumbnails that actually uh, were part of the, the, the basic concept, the thumbnail concept for the Mach 5. And once I got it to the part, to the place where I knew what I wanted generally the shoe to come out like, then you start the process of the final uh, drawing. You know, and this is the engineering portion. Um, and this particular one at first, you know, you see you basically working to try to get the shape. Um, this is overlay number one. And final drawings, again, are strictly overlaid. Um, you can see these, I was, you know, these were, this was done years ago, but I still have the finals. You know, I adjusted the shape a little bit um, for sketch number two. Uh, and kind of generally placed some of the pattern parts that came from the, uh, the final thumbnail concept, right? Just kind of left at that point. And then sketch number three, uh, what I'm working on is trying to figure out how to get the uh, eyelets. You know, what do I want to do with the eyelets? What do I want to do with the outsole? There's a lot of different things that are actually still being worked out. Maybe a little bit of the shape. Uh, here I'm laying down, I'm also laying down the, uh, the lug thickness for the outsole. Outsole, right? Kind of figuring out what is, what is the correct thickness, is, you know, how far off the ground, right? So I added these um, eyelet overlays, you know, and I'm playing with the eyelet. Um, the look of the eyelets is number four, it's number three. You know, playing around a little bit with the outsole, the aperture gets smaller. Kind of the outsole shape of still sidewall of the outsole mid, so I'm trying to figure out. Um, sketch number four, sketch number five. I start to realize, hey, if I put a quarter panel, you know, which ends up sticking to the final, uh, made out of woven uh, mesh. You know, that actually makes it pretty cool. You get that angle there, but I still haven't figured out the eyelets. So I'm trying to figure out what eyelets want to go on here and keeping this general concept. Always try to keep the essence of the original thumbnail, right? Sketch number five. Go from five to six. I kind of inked that out. And I can see here in sketch number one that I was trying to uh, utilize kind of like loop eyelets, wire loops, 
You know, right here, I kind of solidified them in pin at these eye, uh, wire loop eyelets. And I'm playing around a little bit with the counter. Um, you see, I, I lined up the line from the counter to this eye stay overlay, right? Where it was crooked there, I saw that, hey, if you line it up, it's cleaner, right? And, I'll try, you know, using this kind of like, reminds me of the Air Max uh, 95 uh, eyelet. You know, do I do it as an overlay or underlay? Do I pick up the lines? I start using these vertical, uh, horizontal lines in the midsole. Do I pick those up in this obviously molded um, eyelet piece? Sketch five, sketch six is missing. I think I'm missing sketch six from it. Oh, this is sketch six. That was sketch five. Um, keeping with the eyelets, I'm thinking maybe to break it up a little bit. So I added a molded eyelet at the top here, if you can see that, right? Looks like a U shape with uh, little eyelet uh, beads at the top. Still playing around with the counter. You know, you know, start to experiment a little bit with uh, a logo or something in the back. You know, you see I'm breaking up the pattern with this little overlay piece right there. It's the beginning of what ends up being the final uh, uh, collar uh, overlay. Right, sketch number seven. Sketch number eight, we cut the light box on to see if I was trying to straighten something out. I already got my lugs down now in seven, right? The lugs were picked up. Uh, I think that's for the first time I added in lugs in sketch seven. Um, a type of lug that matches the heights. So here, um, I actually added these. I think I'm working strictly on the eyelets. See, this, this, that original eyelet that started in the back, I tried to see what it looked like. We'll see what it looks like with three. And these look like beads, uh, sing singular beads, but these are double um, beaded on this kind of horseshoe shaped uh, molded eyelet. Ultimately, I didn't like it. I can remember it uh, clearly that I wasn't a fan of the big low, uh, low, uh, eyelets because they look a little bit, uh, they don't look very flexible. So sketch number nine, still focused on the eyelets. I kind of seem to seem to like what else is going on in the pattern. You see, I pushed the lugs out of the way because I can get to that detail later. Right now, I'm strictly focusing on, you know, how the eyelets want to be worked out. I spaced them a little bit differently. You see, they pull back because those other ones are a little tall, so they get, they're tall like that, they get close to touching together uh, when you lace the shoe together. And then sketch number nine, I can move toward like a single, these, these beaded eyelets, and there's six of them in that sketch. And uh, overlay number 10, uh, there are still six, and I'm playing around with the shape at that point. Do I want them to be round? Do I want them to be straight in line the way that they are there? Right, sketch number, I mean, overlay number 10. You see, the pattern is not moving. I think there's a toe cap. There's a little bit of experimentation going on in the toe cap, actually, between uh, eight, nine, and 10. I've got like a little bit of a dip thing that I'm playing with right down here. Um, sketch number 11, still, you know, trying to figure out what, is, what do the eyelets want to do? You know, what's going on? What is the, uh, still kind of got a general sock construction. If you look at that point, you know, in the, uh, the tongue and collar is, is one piece. It's like a traditional, like a uh, aqua sock type, uh, almost like the Hirachi type of uh, tongue. Very minimal work being done on the outside, also a little bit of a, you know, experimentation to see, do I want the lugs to come up off the ground in the arch area? Most of the work is being done on the eyelets at this point. Let's get uh, overlay number 11, number 12. You know, you see I'm struggling with the eyelets. I don't not, you know, I don't feel like it has, uh, it's doing what it needs in terms of the, um, the eyelets. So I'm still a little playing around. Starting to get into the stabilizer a little bit. Shaping in the stabilizer, which immediately on a lot of the earlier sketches it had this <clears throat> wing shape. I did like that. But what's going on inside of it? Um, so I'm working on details for that. This is the thinking process. This is pure engineering. You know, what looks good and will function and work well. Uh, from there, I go from sketch number 12 to double 12. Maybe thinking of one of these as a copy. I don't know why I have two sketch number 12. Um, and you put them together, a little bit of playing around with this, the, uh, the, the heel, uh, the midsole of the heel, playing around with the opening. Actually, I move away from the sock, and purely sock construction, and I go with a split, you know, traditional tongue, separate tongue. Um, still playing around with the eyelets. You know, I changed the vamp a little bit. I moved away from this vamp, which I had been using for at least a couple of sketches, right? I want to do something different. And actually, that, that's part of the moving away from the sock, uh, making it more like a traditional uh, tongue construction with this, what's called a uh, blucher. We get into either the blucher versus the euthro uh, construction on the, the above, at the top of the vent. Sketch number 13. You know, I'm still keeping with this four uh, molded eyelet, kind of in a row, 
two uh, punched eyelets at the at the end, and it's got this uh, metatarsal head that begins to develop. Uh, it actually came out of, it wasn't there in sketch 12, the early, earlier version is 12 or earlier, but the secondary sketch 12, all of a sudden it's got this metatarsal head, sketch number 13, that metatarsal head kind of extends back a little bit to give it some a little bit of funk. And I think that's actually nice too, it's a very nice line. I think this pretty much stays with the shoe uh, until the end. Uh, I got another sketch number 13, I believe this is a Xerox copy. No. Maybe the shape was there. No, it's not. It's a totally different sketch in black ink. I don't know why the two 13s like that. But it's got the same four eyelid. I think I was reconsidering whether that metatarsal had needed to be that way or not. Um, being that it was on sketch 12, it was on the first version of sketch 13. And I was look, still looking for different options. It just something better. I almost reverted back to the sock construction again in sketch 13. All right. Sketch 14. Still playing with the metatarsal. I'm all, I seem to be over the eyelids. I think the eyelids at that point are, I'm satisfied with what I want to do with the eyelids. So now I'm more looking at the uh, the pattern, back at the pattern pieces, the toe cap, uh, metatarsal head. You know, you see all of these line up perfectly because they're overlaid off, off of each other, right? Same shape, very minimum adjustment to the shapes, right? Stabilizer details are coming together. And here you can see I was working on the midsole actually too. It starts to play around with these uh, horizontal lines at the top of the midsole. Here's a sub, another sick edge 14. I think I took it and just added more details. Let's look at the way the two match up. Not a perfect overlay, so yeah, I was doing a lot. Still playing with the top line, went back to the traditional uh, tongue construction, did away with the uh, this vamp. And, and the toe cap went back to the metatarsal head, decided on, finally decided on, this is the first time that the molded um, counter appears, right? Sketch number 14, sketch, uh, the earlier sketches didn't have that molded counter, there was at least a little piece on it. See, it's molded because it's got the stitch groove already built into it, and it's got these kind of shingles uh, already there. I, I, obviously, I like that because I went with it at the end. Um, eyelids will still stay the same, kept the metatarsal head, now I'm beginning to play with logos. On, on, on the uh, tongue, uh, remember traditional tongue, looks kind of half sockish with this round shape like this, this still feels like a, uh, a, a sock, but just with a, with a split um, so that you have a traditional uh, tongue. Uh, sketch 15, I begin to add the fila flag, uh, or vector if you will, onto this shape, um, which the rest of the pattern clearly I like because I've been sticking with it. Metatarsal head is still there. Uh, tongue shape looks like it wants to stay the same. Now I'm zeroing on a vector. It would, this will be very, it's, it's a perfect place for a feel of flag. They call, what they call the feel of flag. Um, looks a lot more like a saber to me. Right, so that's the first one. I'm playing around with the shape of it uh, in 15. Uh, sketch 15 again, I got, I took that flag with a, this is not the final shape, which I remember how the final shape comes out, but I added the rest of the parts into the first version of this flag. Um, so I'm adding different parts and I think the collar all of a sudden begins to appear this way, you know, kind of working in conjunction with the flag, the collar overlay, right? Everything else is pretty much the same. Still playing around a little bit down here in the, out the midsole. You see it's got, a, it's got a diamond type of configuration happening. Engineering wise though, you got these, these sharp corners uh, in the middle of the outsole. Uh, I'm trying to remember exactly how the final final came out. I think they stayed. I wonder if when these under pressure, these create pressure points. Uh, remember, this is rigid um, PVC or TPU, whatever I decide to actually use. PU, um, these sharp angles are never great. They can actually collapse uh, very easily because there's a weak point right here at the corner. You know, thinking like an engineer, how, how will this shoe actually function when you're wearing it? Although the strike point is here in the heel, the strike point is also on the ball, whether you run off the ball of your foot or the heel of your foot, this stabilizer still is gonna get a lot of straightforward downward pressure. Or if you strike on the ball and you roll forward, it's gonna, it's gonna have pressure. If you strike on, your, on the heel and roll forward, if you strike on the ball on your toe and you roll backwards, um, you'll still get a little bit. So these are probably not that wide. I don't know if I can remember how the final, I guess we'll be looking at this. I should put the final pad up on the screen, how it actually ended up. Um, sketch number 16. Um, let's add into the, the uh, also on the collar in sketch number 15, you see these little slots, these little air vents being added to the molded counter. Uh, ske sketch 16, if you notice the hook in the flag is starting to change a little bit. 
you know, I feel like this one is a little kind of, uh, it's not strong enough. It's not a sexy shape. Um, this is kind of looks a little better the way it drops down and comes in. It's playing off the counter better. Playing with the lines. Change that collar logo. It's too generic like that. Give it something personalized. Got the wing on there. Mach 5 is a dope name. Uh, you know, Mach 5 Black Speed Racer's car um, versus Mach 1 or uh, I think this was, uh, this wing is pretty nice for a runner. Um, this would be considered an uh, an individual style graphic where these are corporate graphics. The other one that was on it was a corporate graphic. This is a, a graphic specifically for this shoe. That was the intention. Uh, and then you got the final there. Uh, I think the difference between a final 15 and 17, a little bit the flag, and that's so much of a harsh angle, a little bit more of a round, rounded angle like the final one. Um, the counter is almost the same. Uh, very little done. I think I added the main lining. You can see it's on there. Still got your metatarsal head. Very little done with the eyelets. Took the stitching off. That stitch line is a little too strong. This is just, this indicates that this would be a flap, you know. But uh, I think this is on a final. But I, I didn't sketch it again on the sketch 17. There's actually a sketch 18 that has a few more details, but you get a rough idea on how that's done. So we got the Grand Hill. Uh, 20th anniversary, um, AKA the Triumph. Uh, again, early sketch phase. A lot of the sole of the shoe was worked out in the thumbnail sketches. So here I'm trying to get those thumbnails to actually work on an actual size shoe. This is a big, you know, this would be almost like a size, if I place a size nine next to it, um, you know, it's almost actual size. So of course the first sketch is usually, you know, you know, trying to get the shape, I mean the shape is close to the exaggerated uh, thumbnail sketch. Um, when I go to sketch number two from sketch number one, um, first thing you see is that the uh, I'm wrestling with the, the actual shape to get it to look like an actual shoe. Got the outsole on here already, so as I'm sketching the upper, I'm working on the outsole. I'm going through the process of warming up what the outsole actually wants to be. And this thing already from this thumbnail sketch had this these circular, uh, you know, um, seven circles uh, rings on the outsole. Um, base, but just how they actually evolve. This will be picked up when we get into the outsole, but it's actually there as I'm going through these thumbnails. Um, drawing from the toe view early on, trying to see what I want to work out. So you see how I want to work that out. So first thing you try to figure out, how's it going to lace? You know, in the sketch, it doesn't really indicate um, exactly what the lacing system is. So lacing is always one of the first things that you got to figure out. Um, also figure out how the graphics can work. If this works graphically, my color blocking was worked out in my thumbnail sketch. Now I got to figure out well, where the logos go. Um, so in sketch number two, I'm still working on shape, working on logos. Um, sketch number three here between sketch number two, still trying to figure out lacing, working on the top line of the midsole. Okay, so you got this stripe you want to come through the shoe. And this is the essence of engineering. You got all, all the thumbnail has is I want to have a circle that comes down and hovers across the floor ground and comes back up. Well, where's your midsole at? You know, where are the, you know, where are the other parts of the shoe at? Will it have a stabilizer? Where's the stabilizer sit at? Where's the upper end and the midsole start? So I'm working on those lines. I'm like, look, I can cut it like this somehow. This is the hardest work at the very beginning. I mean, you can see the outsole's already evolving on its own separately. I'm looking at different ways to break it up. These are clearly, these are flex grooves. Flex grooves could go like that, could, you know, could go like that. I actually obviously like that because it stays until the end of the shoe, which was in the very beginning sketch. So trying to figure out the top line, looks like the first, uh, the, the order of business on this, um, uh, the Triumph. Um, and uh, the lacing at the same time. So you can see the top line switch between that to that. You know, how's it, you know, this is, if this is predictable, this is a pretty interesting shape. It's almost like a fin. You know, you got a shark fin, early, wink, wink, early on in this, in this concept. This is retardedly sick shark fin. Uh, uh, I, uh, a new, you know, development, a brand new concept for a fin comes off of this shoe. But at the very beginning, I'm just trying to figure out the top line. You know, with, with you know, toe, toe cap. What are the lines of the pattern on this uh, highly uh, graphic uh, driven uh, upper thumbnail? You know, so I go through, I drop the outsole pieces out as I'm on this one. I'm still wrestling with the top line, sketch number four. You know, still trying to figure out the, uh, um, the lacing. Uh, there's really not much that I could do with the spacing based on this ring, the way that it comes around um, on a pattern. Um, reintroduce the outsole again. Doesn't look like it changed really much. Just playing around with a couple of concepts. Now I got to possibly a, 
type of speed stripe going through the middle and this wrap up. I know I'm gonna have a wrap up on the back of the shoe. I think it was there from the very beginning. It's there on the thumbnail, kind of a wrap look. Um, and it, but this fit is starting to evolve. Something interesting is starting to happen there. Right in between sketch number five and sketch number six, you see in the engineering, there's a gap here. So I'm trying to figure out, this is gonna be midsole material. Yes, the midsole could come up and do that. Matter of fact, you can have a little back midsole piece like this. This was popular in 2016. There were shoes that were starting to have a big chunk of midsole like they're on the back. I'm trying to remember, um, you, you know the patterns. I think the, um, the mag, uh, Nike mag, um, actually had this type of a chunk and there were other Nikes that Nikes, uh, that actually had chunk midsole up on, a mid, up on a heel like that. But there's a gap. You notice there's a gap between, so what does this strike turn to from here to here? This could be paint, this could be paint. What is this here? Is this gonna be more pattern? Maybe I need to close that gap. So you can see from sketch number five and even before, this is an unofficial mid uh, way sketch between five and six. I'm actually working on closing that gap and I'm focused in on around the same construction, trying to engineer the way the shoe will actually be made. Um, aside from what the, the thumbnail sketch is, kind of like a dreamy concept. If I could have a, a, an ideal shoe and I think I can make it, it would look like the thumbnail. But this is bringing it down to the to, uh, you know, to bring it into reality. So I see, I, you know, these are both two midsole pieces, compression molded, compression molded EVA. It could be, I wouldn't, I don't like to use a lot of poured um, PU because poured PU is very heavy. PU period is heavy. EVA is light. Um, they, now, they now have the foam, um, you know, like the boost foam that is used. And it's, it's, uh, I believe those are injection molded. I'm not 100% sure. Maybe compression molded, but they're definitely very light. They're light, like EVA. Compression molded EVA is very light. This looks like it could be a pour, but I know I'm definitely moving towards um, compression molded EVA. I'm also developing and playing around. I'm starting to play around more with the lugs you saw on that little semi between stage sketch. Um, sketch number seven. Still playing with logs. Um, I'm, I think I'm satisfied with this piece here, so I move off of that, and now I'm working on uh, the strap and the vamp. You know, trying to develop what, what's going to happen on the vamp as I speed up here. Uh, different type of outsole, you know, lug treatments and looks. This vamp begins to have uh, the concept of having an embossed uh, story on the vamp. Started on sketch number seven uh, and continued on sketch number eight. Um, the eyelets look like they settled in being just those wires like I had it. They, this is called hidden eyelets um, when, they're, when they're underneath the eye stay or if, if they were totally disappeared and you'd have to pull the eye stay back to look at it, those are called hidden eyelets. So this is like a partially hidden, partially peeking out um, wire loop uh, eyelet. Sketch number nine, still playing with the vamp, different ways to emboss it. How does the embossment want to look? Are there any other lines that I could pick up in the process? Um, I introduced the hill view so I can begin to try to figure out what the lugs are doing on the hill, which at this point in, in sketch number eight and seven, I'm just swinging, but I haven't really, I'm not satisfied with what I want to have in the lugs. They ultimately came out really, really awesome, but here early on, I'm trying different things, different looks, right? Color blocked it real quick just to check my work, but make sure I'm at, uh, you know, I'm on point with how the graphic can flow together. And the way this worked out on the final shoe is this um, leather overlay um, panel. This is painted, this is painted, and right here, this begins, I think I start working the idea of having this as, as um, a stabilizer. Actually not made out of EVA, but made out of PVC, like a PVC uh, stabilizer, PU, PVC, TP, uh, polypropylene or something like that, which is how the final came out. You'll notice here that missing element that actually shows up on the end, which is a, a, a horizontal fin that sits underneath this vertical fin, hasn't appeared yet. Um, sketch 11. You know, again, so reminding that all these sketches are overlays. When you're, when you're working real size, you know, rather than reinventing the wheel, sketching the shoe over it, the key is to use an overlay. You know, and build off of your, your work from before. You're basically refining your, the pattern, right? You can make little tweaks if you want to change the shape a little bit. Constantly tinkering with the shape, but you're always using the prior sketch to get to the next one, right? So here, uh, you can see there's a little bit of experimentation between 10 and 11 where this, this kind of like uh, circular shape appears um, in the forefoot. And this almost kind of has almost like a machinery machine look. Like there's a giant um, lynch pin here as well as a, that plays off the lynch pin that's here. Right in the ball of the foot where you would think it would, you know, if you were a robot, your foot would lynch right there. It would, it would, it would, it would bend right there. It would hinge right there. So sketch 11. 
sketch number 12. I kept that circular part. I don't want to turn my computer on. I can't remember what the grand actually looked like at the end of this point. I should have it in front of me. But uh, I'm working out this particular shape. It looks like it's staying so far. Now I'm trying to figure out what to do with this negative space um, on the vamp and on the quarter panel. It looks like I'm playing around with uh, embossing, trying to continue the embossing story from the vamp into the quarter panel. Sketch number 12, right? It's a secondary sketch number 12 that does exactly that. And you can see these old drawings are stained and everything, time lapsed. Uh, so you see that the embossing, so now I'm trying to figure out, so what type of embossing? You know, what kind of story can I tell with embossing? What type of pattern can I create? Everything else looks like it's kind of worked itself out. The lugs are slowly falling in place. Remember, we haven't even gotten to the part where we're designing the midsole yet. We were designing the outsole um, to the point that you got to get it exact and then you punch it in the drafting. That's a stage that's going to come along two steps from now. But in the thumbnailing, we're working hard enough that we're, we're figuring out a lot of the major, the, the soul of what the outsole wants to be. And this, what we always call these final line drawings. This is pre-drafting. And one of the things I see here is that this midsole actually also is has been overlasted. My intention from the very beginning is to use overlasting, which is a format where the upper pattern covers the midsole, uh, up in the front at least, all right? Um, again, that's, I'm trying to remember how that came out on the final. Now that's sketch number, that's the secondary sketch number 12. Sketch number 13, I'm still looking at uh, um, embossing you know, uh, uh, patterns that I can use. You know, it's really hard. Some of these I'm just going through. Uh, don't like these so far. This is a interesting cut. So this cuts the pattern. It was considering cutting the pattern to embossed on a, along the mud guard. This is called a mud guard also. Um, and then leaving like mesh, a mesh um, opening in the quarter panel, like quarter panel underlay. Um, ultimately, I know I moved away from that. Um, sketch number 14, still playing around with the embossing. Right, I'm um, working on the tongue uh, strap, you know, assembly. I think that started to, assembly came around, actually the assembly started to evolve a few sketches earlier, sketches 12 and 13. Um, but the embossing comes up through the um, top of the collar uh, overlay there. So then I add the, uh, here you see I added in the tongue, it would be really cool if we had the, uh, the woven mesh um, still got this underlay uh, panel in the quarter. Uh, sketch number 16, the laces are pretty much staying the same. Looking at the outsole, trying to figure out what lines will work on the, the uh, vamp. Uh, the Triumph actually never got to, in its prototype format, never made it to the second round prototype. It was a story that actually happened. I, I'm in love with the first round, um, but we didn't really get a second round. I wonder if I would have kept this panel this way or taken it out. But now this, um, this kind of mud guard terminates underneath the stabilizer. You know, so now the quarter panel is not so predictable. It kind of comes over and drops down. Whenever you're designing a pattern, it's always nice to do something that is a, uh, a little bit fresh uh, and original. And um, one of my pages got away from me here. And then final, and finally in sketch number 17, uh, the final version of sketch number 17, um, you get the pattern and play around with the lace a little bit, you know, preparing it for uh, final rendering. Um, so I'm playing around with the shape of the lace. But the embossing is, you know, you know, I think it solidifies itself on the final sketch, sketch number 18. I'll throw that up on the screen. The last example that I'm gonna use is the uh, triple double, which is this shoe that I built for the Globe Trotters. Again, one of my favorites. Uh, when I got the first round prototype back, you know, uh, you know, the original concept was to actually have a flap that covered the laces. Um, so you had a full um, lacing um, all the way down to your traditional position. It was a U-throat, it is a U-throat construction, uh, meaning a U-shaped uh, lacing system. It goes right down to the normal size vamp. But the first five laces are covered by this uh, uh, patch, an overlay patch of leather. Um, with two straps holding it down. Originally, the, the initial sketch had two straps, and those two strap, that two strap concept, made it through to the final drawings and into the specs. And it was it was built that way for the first prototype to spec. Uh, but when I got the shoe back, I saw that the front strap was kind of sticking out. It didn't have enough, you know, it, there wasn't enough space for a strap. It would pre pretty much drag on the ground. It just looked like it was out of place. 
Um, so in addition to, you know, finessing all of the rest of the details, which is usually what you're doing between the first round prototype and the last round, I had to figure out, well, you know, how can I close this leather flap uh, in the front? And there's no room for a strap. So as I looked at it, um, I actually ultimately e de designed, I engineered this little elastic strap with metal snaps that would actually, instead of uh, being your traditional, those are, you know, the original straps were torque straps where you take it and loop it through a loop and you pull it back and torque it down. Um, it was an elastic strap that stretched up and went under the flap and it had uh, not only a Velcro uh, tab on the end, like a little hand on the end of this uh, strap, um, with male and female, the, the uh, male, the female portion on the actual strap and the male part on underneath the flap, on uh, the leather, leather overlay flap. That Velcro pad also had a metal snap um, that you couldn't see from the outside, so it looked clean on the, when it was closed, but it, it was strong enough, that snap was strong enough that it held the, the flap closed in case the vac, vel, uh, Velcro failed. And the little uh, elastic piece that stretched under became almost like a shock absorber, you know, so it could, as your foot flexed in that area, it would never come loose because it, that's the way it was engineered. And this is how you have to think as you're building a shoe, as you get to the different stages, you'll never know when some engineering pops up. Um, actually, also on this, uh, the triple double, the, uh, I believe that the, uh, the, um, the metal snaps on the upper part of the strap actually stayed on the outside. I was thinking to myself that it would have been cool to put them in between. But um, yeah, you have to always be ready to solve a problem that may per pop, pop itself up on a, you know, pop up on a shoe. Um, if it's a pro if it looks like a problem, there's a classic saying, they say if three people mention it, then uh, you know it's gonna be a major prop problem. Thousands of people will be complaining about it if it goes into production and they're buying them. So you know, three people are, are mentioning it, then adjust it. Actually, as you get better, you know, at, at being a designer and engineer, you can usually tell on your own. I don't need any to hear anyone mention it. I already know this is a problem. So that's it. Now you know how to engineer and get your shoe to the point where it can reach a final line drawing, an actual line drawing it can be made. Uh, in closing, you know, I wanted to speak to something I said last episode, which is uh, the purpose uh, for me creating Sneaker University. Some may say, well, why are you, if you have this process, why would you give it away for free? Why would you, you know, show your process? You know, I've been in the industry for a very long time. And early on, I would have definitely not shared this because of uh, the way the industry was set up. But I learned um, that there, because of this dynamic between companies and designers, you know, I wanted to empower designers with Sneaker University, first and foremost. There's a dynamic between company owners um, and designers where uh, there's kind of competition. I think, you know, the, the owners of companies are afraid of the power that exists in designers when they're uh, 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 enabled, when they're armed with knowing this full process. And it's probably because I had mentioned industrial design earlier and industrial design speaks to industry, speaks to gross revenues and massive profits and makes, you know, you should think of uh, there's in the United States, it was initially outlawed that there can't be monopolies. I think it's still a law that you can't monopolize any particular business uh, industry, if you will. And um, which means there's, there's, you know, if you're in an industry, you don't want to have to deal with a lot of competition. And it, the, that defines the relationship between designers and company owners is that, uh, you know, company owners don't want more competition. But it causes uh, designers can suffer under those conditions and really it causes the industry to not be at its, you know, operate at its peak. And I don't think it's right. Um, and I want to empower designers and, uh, you know, understanding that also designers, we, we need to work together better. Um, you know, instead of uh, like we do, we hide our concepts from each other, as you should. You're probably smart to, to keep your design to yourself until you capitalize on it. But although that's the case, it doesn't mean that we can't be unified or, or you know, we need to have uh, more solidarity um, in the sneaker industry. That was one of my, my great uh, wishes all throughout my career is that if designers just could just learn to trust each other. I'm famously known for offering jobs to people whenever I had the opportunity. I had you know, maybe it was because I was confident in my design ability, but also I just felt like everyone deserves a chance. And um, so that's what this is about, so that the industry, um, you know, uh, has to make room for designers. When If a designer knows the entire process versus just knowing a part of the process, 
it makes designers that much stronger. You, you, you know where I'm going with this in terms of, uh, you know, being able to create empowers you to be able to, you know, create your own brand, create your own business. So uh, I'm really excited about this. I'm looking forward to uh, building next uh, episode. I'll see you then. We'll be working on CAD development two weeks.